Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Gross and it is my great pleasure to welcome Troy Vitese and Drew Pendergrass in today's episode. They are the authors of the newly released book Half-Earth Socialism. And since Troy and Drew do see democratic economic planning as an integral part of what they propose as Half-Earth Socialism, I was intrigued to read it. And it has been an interesting read for me, I have to say, because there are quite some elements in it that I kind of stumbled over, I would say. And this is, of course, always great for a good interview and an interesting discussion. We didn't really touch the veganism aspect of their proposal in detail. I'll leave that to others to discuss. But we did go into planning, of course, in quite some detail. And I think it made an interesting exchange. I certainly enjoyed talking to Troy and to Drew, and I hope you will enjoy listening Listening to it. Before we start, I would like to thank David, Fabian, Lucas and Wilfried for their donations. And I would like to welcome Björn, Manuel and Gerion as patrons of Future Histories. Thank you so much. If you want to support Future Histories, but you do not have the monetary resources to do so, then first of all, thank you too. It's highly appreciated. And then There is an absolutely brilliant way to support the project in non-monetary form by transcribing your favorite episode. There's a collaborative transcription project that has formed around future histories and I want to thank everybody who has already contributed. So if there's an episode you like and you see a value in providing a transcript of the episode, and I would argue there are many benefits from a transcript, then please find a link and a contact email in the show notes. So go for it and thank you. But now, please enjoy today's episode with Drew Pendergrass and Troy Vitese on Half-Earth Socialism. Welcome, Troy. Welcome, Drew. Thanks for having, Thanks for having us. us. It's a pleasure. Uh, let's start with the definition. What is Half-Earth Socialism? Half-Earth Socialism uh, is a kind of socialism based on the recognition of ecological limits, but also the limits to our understanding of the natural world. And uh, therefore, we're saying that uh, the environmental crisis can only become overcome by socialism because it is only socialism that humans can decide to manage economic growth, and that, which is impossible under capitalism. Um, and then we're also saying that uh, socialists have to be environmentalists because they they have to realize that total control over nature is impossible because the more we intervene in nature, the more risks we take, such as pandemics or climate change. So half of socialism uh, is that in a nutshell, and is also arguing for a uh, Neuratian, you know, conscious control of the economy. And uh, we propose rewilding half the planet, which is the half Earth component, and having uh, energy quotas and uh, veganism to reduce our impact on, on nature, uh, while also ensuring a good life for all. I actually know if I have anything to add, Troy, you did a very good definition. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And before you set out to describe your ideas uh, about how to address climate catastrophe in the book, you dissect uh, some other approaches, three approaches actually, that are brought forward by others. And those are bioenergy, carbon capture and sequestration, it's short BECCS, nuclear power and uh, the idea of half earth itself actually, because the, the origins of this idea of half earth are not quite innocent and uh, there are strands tied to um, this concept that have, I think, some quite Malthusian uh, ring to it, as well as some uh, nativist tendencies, if I'm not mistaken. So these are three um, approaches that you dissect before you lay out your own proposal within the book. Maybe let's take a look at these three um, approaches and um, maybe you can tell us what the shortcomings of these quote unquote solutions are. Yeah, so uh, you're, you're describing here our kind of um, look at uh, um, the sort of half solutions on offer by um, sort of mainstream environmental slash modeling. Um, so I'll, we can take them in turn. So the first option, Bex, is, is an interesting, uh, interesting um, 
kind of modeling artifacts. So the idea with bioengineering with carbon capture and storage effects is that you have plantations of probably trees, and then you cut these down, you burn it for energy, for electricity, you capture the carbon emitted from burning the trees, and then you bury that carbon underground. And the idea is that this is a carbon negative energy source because the carbon released by the trees, you know, the trees capture carbon, they grow, capture that carbon, you put it underground. Um, and this is, believe it or not, integral to pretty much all of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC's um, 1.5 degree models. So uh, limiting climate change to 1.5 degrees and even a lot of the two degree models, um, the idea is that they're, they're, they're trying to model, you know, how you might do this energy transition. It's very hard to do a massive energy transition very quickly. So a lot of the models have overshoot or emit too much or something, and you need to have negative emissions to push you back down they're often very large amounts of negative emissions. So the models produce, you know, these are models that are running blindly. They're just neoclassical models with a climate model attached. And they kind of blindly are like, okay, let's take three India's worth of land, plant some tree plantations, burn it. Like, let's make some nice assumptions that this is carbon negative, like that there's not an unintended consequence by like, say, um, soils control, hold the a lot of the biosphere's carbon, maybe by doing this, we might mess up the soils and the soils might start emitting carbon, you know, bracket all that. And then if you do this, okay, you have a nice solution. You know, you can have your, your energy transition with a lot of room to spare. And the bottom line is this is, this is sort of obviously never going to happen. Uh, it's a massive project with no, um, no movement behind it. It's, uh, it's just, it's a modeling artifact. Um, and if anything, it's harder to do the energy transition than these models make it sound because BEX is so integral to many of these, these models. Now, there are models that don't involve BEX and they involve a much more rapid energy transition. And that's more aligned with what we are talking about, things like um, large amounts of energy use reductions. Um, the second proposal that we talk about is, is um, nuclear power. And we're more specifically talking to a, a specific strain of environmentalists who wants to build like a nuclear power plant a week or something like this, or, or maybe even more. Um, and these two nuclear power plants a week, Troy is telling me. Yeah. So the idea is, you know, we build up this massive inner, this massive electricity capacity. And then, you know, together with a big electrification project, you solve the climate crisis by putting everything on this big nuclear power grid. But this is also seems a little bit ridiculous. Um, for one thing, nuclear power plants are very hard and expensive to build uh, and very complex machines. And we said in the book that um, even if nuclear power plants are, are safer now, there's still a pretty high risk of uh, something like a Fukushima-like disaster, even with our current number of nuclear power plants. Um, so if you add a bunch more, you know that risk goes up. We still haven't solved the nuclear waste problem. The fact that nuclear power is connected to nuclear weapons in an intimate way is also uh, another existential threat to worry about. And then also the fact that if you build this many power plants, you know, you are manning a lot of uranium. Uranium is a pretty nasty thing to mine. It gets impure pretty quickly once you mine out of the, the good, I guess, the high quality ores. And then you end up with uh, some problems. Um, and proposed solutions to do different kinds of reactors like fast reactors have problems because they use sodium as a coolant and sodium explodes when exp exposed to air. Um, and that's just, uh, <laughs> so we just don't think that this is a plausible plan. And then the final one we talk about is the half earth. And many on the left are familiar with the, the, the um, difficulties of the conservation movement, the, the quite nasty side of it. And we, we don't hold any punches here. Um, so the half worth idea uh, comes out of uh, an intellectual tradition that uh, has pretty nasty uh, relationship with indigenous peoples and this sort of this sort of thing. And E.O. Wilson, who ends up taking it on uh, and popularizing it in, in a 2014 book, he is uh, better than some of these conservationists, but that's not saying much because he is quite notorious for his um, sociobiology is sort of, um, uh, you know, determinism on the basis of genes and that sort of thing. So pretty antithetical to what we believe on the left, right? But um, while interrogating this tradition, what we think is important is that mass extinction, the ongoing uh, sixth mass extinction in Earth's history is something that we on the left need to care about. Um, so the sixth mass extinction is going on now driven by human activity. 
there have been five previous mass extinctions. Uh, they are disastrous for life on Earth, not just because we should care about other species on this planet, but in terms of, uh, in science, we call it ecosystem services. Um, so nature does things for us, like keep the water clean, you know, uh, pollinate our crops, you know, uh, make sure that uh, uh, disease is kept at bay, you know, all sorts of vital functions. Um, and if this ecosystem functioning and, and also carbon capture, like half of the carbon we've emitted has been captured by uh, either the oceans or the land. And some of that's inorganic, but but a good bit of it is is through life on earth. So this these are just parts of the planet that we can't afford to lose. And the thing that drives um, mass extinction uh, perhaps the most is, is habitat loss. So we need to take seriously the idea that um, Habitat loss is a problem. It's driving a major environmental crisis. It's a crisis that will affect all of us, that affects our prospects of having a good life, and it affects other species on this planet that we should care about too. Um, so uh, basically, we, should, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, but we shouldn't like uh, maybe not interrogate the bathwater, I guess, to use this metaphor badly. Um, so we, we talk about how uh, biodiversity is higher in indigenous uh, uh, managed lands than uh, nature preserves in many cases. So there's no need to inherit these nasty sides of conservation, but we still need to take seriously the need to protect nature. Okay, that's interesting because uh, now you kind of implicitly already um, answered a question I had um, regarding why you stick to this concept of half earth, because to me it, it, it felt as if be maybe because of this uh, history that this concept has and the line of thinking that underlies it, which has a, in some parts, slightly semi-authoritarian touch, I'd say. Um, it, the, the question, it begs the question how to to avoid including these highly problematic aspects of the of the concept of half earth because it's not just the ignorance towards indigenous knowledges and um, different other uh, problems that that this um, like conservative conservationist movement uh, has but also at least to me when reading the book you will always come into a position where if you start by having a very concrete idea of how things should be in the beginning, you will come into the position where you will kind of have to construct a system that necessarily, quote unquote, forces people into what you believe is the correct answer to the problem. And so there's a, the, a specific line of argument, a line of reasoning underlying this, uh, this, this whole idea that kind of um, brings you in the territory where you will have to confront the question of, um, like, in this case, also central authoritarian tendencies. But I don't think we're naive liberals here where we think that, oh, it's just a matter of individual choice is going to solve any of these problems. I mean, we don't use, we don't think this way when it comes to fossil fuels. I think socialists are comfortable enough saying that like, we have to get rid of fossil fuels quickly. And that's going to require how we live and it's going to force how a lot of people who use a lot of fossil fuels to change how they live. And that's, you know, we're also quite comfortable saying we want equality. That means no more rich people. I mean, like we're happy saying all these things, but when it comes to meat or, you know, the animal question in general, then people say, oh, hey, you can't, you can't say that. And I think we, you know, on the left, we need to have a real discussion about, you know, what do socialists, Uh, and what is a socialist ethic towards uh, animals and, and what what is the relationship we want with animals? And this book tries to push that forward. But we make clear in the book that our approach or what we're arguing, arguing in the book is really two separate things. One is uh, a way to think about um, what socialism is in practice. And this is where we draw on Neurat. We're saying it's, it's important to have this utopian tradition where people come up with total plans or what he calls like social engineering. And then people compare these utopian future plans and then vote on them and they decide upon them. Uh, versus, and the second part would be what we think those future plans should be. We offer our own future plan. But we say quite clearly, you know, also because at some level we have no power. We can't force anyone to do anything. But we we say 
you know, if you don't agree with us, that's fine. But then we have to make trade-offs somewhere. We have to say, okay, we're happy to have zoonotic disease and mass extinction and, and that's okay. Or we have to live with more nuclear power plants and, you know, because we, we can't produce enough energy for these really high energy quotas or, or whatever it is. But we need to have this discussion about what kind of life we want and to kind of keep it like a veil over this future society is, is not proven to be a successful strategy. And I think it also is missing the key insight of Neurat, which is socialism is this collective decision over our future. And to keep it obscure is actually quite a, a neoliberal move. Like only the, the market can, can know something as complex as this. So again, the book is doing two things. And um, we like to think we make a good case for, for vegan rewilding, but uh, we want to have more debates about what this future should be. Yeah, democracy is a very big theme in the book, um, the, uh, and it's a major part of, um, in the portion of the book that's dealing with planning, because we kind of take that, the magnitude of changes required to do the energy transition alone, let alone address other parts of the climate crisis, is simply a massive task for planning. And the question is, how can you plan in a way that is uh, democratic and doesn't concentrate power in the hands of uh, maybe a small bureaucracy or some some bureaucracy that's unaccountable to to uh, the rest of humanity. Um, so we take this problem very seriously, and as Joe was saying, we we have this idea of um, you know these total plants where you might have a plan that involves you know higher use of fossil fuels with solar geoengineering to cool the climate, and that would come with huge amounts of risks and maybe many disasters caused, but uh, perhaps that would be the one that wins out in our imagined parliament and uh, me and Tro would just be unhappy in the opposition, but that would be, you know, uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. But the, ho the hope would be that we make a clear choice about what's going on, because right now we're fumbling blindly into the future. Uh, people aren't aware of the trade-offs of decisions, like having a massive um, animal industry causes uh, huge amounts of land to be used in a very inefficient way, uh, you know, burning down the Amazon to make new pastures for cattle, you know, uh, it's not exactly a great planning choice. And I think, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's uh, the, these things are talked about blindly and in isolation, but when they're combined together uh, and the trade-offs are more apparent, that's sort of when democracy can really begin and when kind of a more sensible, I don't know, control of the planet can, can start. Before we get to the to the planning part, and this will be, of course, uh, a big part of our um, conversation today. Before we get to the planning part, maybe you could uh, say some words about your position towards uh, epistemic uh, groundings of this uh, proposal in terms of uh, planning, because I, um, I think what is very much relevant for the the whole concept that you uh, propose and relevant for also a lot of the questions I had after reading the book is uh, what information do you think we need and how much can we actually know? Because you in the book, you make use of um, uh, certain types of modeling. You propose that we can use um, like modern modeling technology in terms of climate modeling. We could repurpose it for um, uh, questions of planning. And also when it comes to the question whether or not a maybe more decentralized version of planning would be interesting or a central one. Um, again, the question of um, epistemic assumptions about what knowledge can somebody have and where can it be located comes up. So I would be interested in in what was the epistemic grounding when you, when you were thinking about how this uh, planning procedure could be sketched out. So uh, one of the foundations for the book from the very beginning is this... Uh, this uh, dialogue with the neoliberals, with them, um, with Hayek and von Mises, and and um, what the neoliberals use. Uh, and Troy, you can jump in in a little bit and, and talk more about your your favorite uh, baddies. But the um, what the neoliberals say is basically that markets are information collecting machines. They're they're machines for information, where uh, you know the price acts as a sort of a decentralized signal that allows everyone to kind of respond in concert to changes. And they don't need to necessarily know why the price is that, but it allows them to make according plans. Um, and a uh, big part of the idea here is that uh, 
human intervention in the market will always be misguided because the market is sort of beyond human. It's it's a it's a machine that is too you know complex and important to to mess with, and therefore we should we should leave it alone and let it go about its information business. And we should add markets in as many places as we can, even where there aren't markets already. Um, so it's an epistemic argument. Uh, it's an argument that we can't know about the market. Um, and interestingly, they use a lot of natural me metaphors, biological metaphors to, um, to back up this claim. Uh, so they use biology as a metaphor for the economy, uh, rather than the neoclassical metaphor of physics uh, to understand making equations, right, to model the economy. What we point out is that the obvious point that if you're using nature as a metaphor for how comp complex the economy is, well, surely nature is is more complicated than that. And we talk a lot about how complex nature is and how it evades attempts of management, um, many attempts of management. We talk about the ozone hole, right? Where the um, chlorofluorocarbons were used to replace dangerous refrigerants. And uh, these were supposed to be completely non-reactive, like all chemistry up to that point, we're like, yeah, you know, these are tightly bound, nothing's gonna break these molecules apart. It turns out that in the stratosphere, under certain conditions in over Antarctica and to some extent over the Arctic in the winter and in the spring, you know, you can get this breaking apart and then you can get uh, chlorine radical cycles that just completely eviscerate the ozone layer. And we just got lucky with this. We got lucky that it only destroyed the ozone layer of Antarctica. If the rate constants were different, then maybe it would go all over. So it's just, it's, uh, it was just lucky. This was an intervention that had all the kind of basis behind it, um, all the kind of research behind it. And so it's just kind of a lesson that interventions into the environment are, are risky. Um, they, uh, it's a very complex place. We also use the metaphor of biosphere too, which was an attempt to make an artificial closed ecosystem with like an artificial coral reef, a bunch of different biomes, like in a little dome and have some humans inside and be supported. And it completely collapsed rather quickly because of unintended consequences like, um, uh, the concrete reacted with the oxygen and uh, and they needed to pump in more oxygen so people wouldn't die. All this, most of the species died, but the invasive cockroaches thrived. You know, it was a, it was a disaster. And it's a, it's a lesson in how complex ecosystem services are. Um, so we point out that basically the question comes down to, are you going to plan nature? Basically, are you going to use geoengineering? Are you going to, you know, for example, spray sulfur into the stratosphere to cool the planet? and make the world safe for markets to continue to go about their business? Or are you going to step in and say that humans must plan our own activities, the economy, and uh, not attempt to plan nature more than a certain amount uh, described maybe by a vote? Uh, we obviously have to intervene in nature to like grow food and to supply ourselves with the resources we need. But we argue that, that we should set some conscious limits there uh, so that we allow nature to have its its continued functioning. I, I definitely agree with what Drew said, and uh, Drew can speak more about the technical aspects of how do you have, like, how do you relate a global plan to this, like, a series of regional and local plans? Uh, how do you uh, use uh, linear programming to you know, plan the future as well, which is Ken what one thing Kentorovich you know, worked on. But I, uh, what I'm going to say is relating more to uh, this neoliberal question of you know, what, what can be known. And we can be engaged quite a bit with neoliberals because we think they really raise an interesting point, which is uh, economics is where uh, is a question of knowledge. And we think socialists haven't dealt very well uh, with this, or at some level, a lot of the market socialists just say Mises was right and, and Neurat was wrong. Uh, and therefore, you know, you need, you need markets under socialism. And we still think uh, Neurat's critique of pseudo-rationality uh, holds true, where if you, you have markets based on some kind of universal metric, you know, if it's labor time, you know, chits, or is it uh, uh, energy or you know, what have you, it would eventually lead to irrational outcomes. And the only way to rationally manage ourselves as a species is to recognize that they're incommensurate uh, units, and we have to judge the totality, which is, again, what, what Neurat argues. Um, and we're not saying this is going to be easy. We're not saying that 
it's going to work perfectly. I mean, we get into Cornai and this idea that socialism leads towards shortage often. And at some level, we're saying we have to make a choice um, between do we want restraint and shortage or do we want uh, you know, excess and, and, and disaster and excesses that we don't want as well. The other thing I would say is that I think it's true at some level what uh, socialists and, and neoliberals uh, point out. I mean, I think at some level it's true that um, it, you can, it's hard to make up for or compensate for uh, or replace tacit knowledge as the person on the ground will have a better view of things than the planner far away. That That is true. But there is also a value to having a, a, an attempt to see the whole. And the problems that we're facing now, I think, are better faced with, with the latter, with attempts to grasp the whole than with the attempts from a point of view of a single person. And that's uh, the wager we're making. That's very interesting. And we will come back to this because I have uh, some uh, follow-up questions regarding exactly that. But before we do so, I think it would be important for our listeners, for, for the audience to maybe take a step back and like cautiously uh, get into the, the planning stuff because um, you argue actually for a synthesis of different approaches, including, as you already mentioned, in Natura calculation as proposed by Otto Neurath. But you also include uh, Kantorowicz's uh, linear programming, cybernetics in the form of Stafford Beer's viable systems model. What elements from these different approaches do you think uh, should be incorporated in contemporary eco-socialist planning and how does the resulting planning mechanism actually look like? Yeah, so to do a, a high-level overview, um, the basic idea is to have, um, we kind of imagine sort of roughly that you would have some set of total plans, so visions that are coherent for the, for the future that um, are then made available for, for a vote and then are produced in turn also with uh, lots of input from Uh, people and, and various interests. And so how you would devise these sort of, I, you would call them maybe blueprints for the future. And you might use many different uh, methodologies to produce such a blueprint. Um, one important historical algorithm that is still very important today is uh, linear programming, which is a way of doing constrained optimization. So if you have a set of constraints that you propose, uh, like we have only, you know, this many people working this many hours and we need to produce these goods, you know, what's an optimal solution or an optimal way of distributing this work. And this is used all the time in corporate planning. This is used all the time in designing renewable energy systems. Uh, it's a very commonly used algorithm, but there are, of course, many other ways, many other tools that one can use. The idea is to make like kind of a rough draft, no need to go into super deep detail, and it's not even probably possible, but to give people an idea of like, okay, if we have a high energy use future, this is the sort of resources we'll need. This is this amount of maybe mining labor. This is the amount of Uh, X, Y, Z, and these are the uh, the natural risks, the, the risks of climate change, the risks of uh, geoengineering, the risks of X, Y, Z involved in this plan. And then you might have another plan that's more in line with what me and Troy are proposing. So you give up uh, meat uh, and maybe there could be variations of how much meat and animal products are given up. Um, And then you, you can talk about the benefits and, and, uh, and the sacrifices involved. And then hopefully you come to a vote uh, and you come up with a, a particular path forward. And then from there, you have to go to day-to-day -day management. Um, and this is where we draw on more of the Stafford beer. Yes, Troy. I just wanted to point out that Drew has already made a, a model a very basic linear programming model with these constraints between energy use and land use and extinction rate and all that. And we use that in the book and we say, okay, well, what if we want this quota for energy or what if we want to protect this much land? And then we, then we test the constraints and see if that plan is viable. And again, this is a very basic model that's already more complex than Nordhaus's DICE model. Right, and uh, this is not this is not hard to do. To have like a very basic uh, discussion about what's what's possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, very basic model, but the idea is basically being like, okay, if you assume a certain amount of electrification, you know, how much, you know, what would your energy mix look like, that sort of thing. But um, you know, from from there, you have to go to day to day management. Um, so we talk a little bit about um, the CyberSyn experiment and in uh, Salvador Allende's uh, democratic socialist experiment in, in Chile. 
in the early 1970s. Uh, and the idea here was that uh, the Allende government was bringing in industries into the state controlled sector, and they needed to basically organize and plan this rapidly growing sector of the economy. And so some Chilean uh, engineers brought in Stafford Beer, who is a British uh, cybernetics person. Uh, and the I, Beer had this model that he had been working on, this kind of management model that was hoping to, to your earlier point, try and balance the appropriate amount of centralization to make sure that resources are being allocated sensibly with enough decentralization to prevent any uh, irrational outcomes or uh, violations of the democratic socialist principles that Allende's uh, revolution was built on top of. So both kind of making use of sort of tacit knowledge of closer to a particular circumstance and also preventing any uh, uh, unjust or undemocratic uh, bureaucracy from emerging. Um, and it's a lot of detail to get into, but the basic idea of the viable, viable systems model is there's you can kind of let, say, a factory manage itself most of the time, kind of letting, uh, you know, higher authorities know its inputs and outputs. Although Stafford Beer would hate me saying higher authority. He, he considered this whole thing level. Um, uh, you know, but like letting uh, more central uh, uh, information managers knowing inputs and outputs and then uh, emergencies could be bumped up to, um, to higher levels of coordination. And again, Stafford Beer would hate me saying higher. But um, this, this proves its mettle in a CIA-backed uh, strike against the logistics sector, against the trucking sector. So basically the entire transport of materials breaks down in Chile. And they had all some, some loyal trucks left. Uh, and the question was, how can we make sure everyone gets food? And how can we make sure that the economy continues to function? And this sort of system allowed basically people on the ground to kind of almost in dialogue with the, the center, uh, direct resources in the most wise way. So like mapping out where this truck should be driving. So it, it was this uh, very uh, remarkable uh, evenness between um, uh, kind of people out in the field and people in uh, the, the center where all this information was kind of coming in and being distributed, where uh, these scarce resources are being allocated uh, reasonably and the country was able to make it through the strike. Uh, successfully. So it's a really uh, interesting kind of management experiment uh, that did use technology, but not as much as I think it, it has a reputation for. These were like primitive fax machines, right, that was required. Um, the computer itself uh, was important, but not hugely. Uh, and then we we bring in uh, some more modern uh, ways of fusing information with modeling uh, from climate science. So climate science and weather are, I think, something that we should be talking about because what the weather system is, what the weather kind of prediction system is, is a truly global system of information. So we have weather models, which are models of physics, uh, but the weather system is chaotic. People have heard of the butterfly effect, right? Butterfly flaps and swings, and then all of a sudden there's a hurricane. Um, and this is uh, the basic idea is that if you have slight changes in your initial conditions, days later, you have a totally different weather system. Um, it's a chaotic system. So you need your initial conditions to be as close to accurate as you can so that your forecast is accurate. And the reason why weather forecasts have improved is because we have better initial conditions. We have better initial conditions because we have a global network of sensors, monitors, and information. We have satellites, we have buoys in the ocean, we have ships, we have aircraft, we have um, monitors on the surface. In fact, during the COVID pandemic, weather forecasts got slightly worse because you didn't have as many planes flying and you didn't have that kind of mid-atmosphere input into your weather model. It's a truly global information system. Um, and the algorithms designed to run this system fuse the sort of model of like what you think should be going on with what's in the world. And if there's divergence between what the model says and what the world says, there are optimal ways to combine those. So if you have a plan for how the economy should work, that plan will obviously fail because, you know, things will not work out the way you assumed, but it should be relatively accurate because it is what the plan is. Um, and so you can update that plan on the basis of, of say, like a factory not receiving its it's steel shipments, and you could maybe go in and see where the problem is and be able to intervene in a way that's sensible, but that also makes sure that autonomy is preserved to as great of an extent as necessary, but also make sure that everyone's working towards common coherent goals. So it's a balancing approach. And these are really remarkable algorithms. I think, I think there needs to be more conversation about them. They're, they're very powerful tools that are already being used to do a form of global 
information management. And I'm very sorry, Drew, but I have to pick up on the question of higher authority <laughs> because you rightly point out that Stefan Beer uh, would be skeptical of this phrase. But when I read specifically the, the narrative part at the end of the book, there uh, is a sense of quote unquote higher authority in, in, in terms of the like central planning board. And as far as I understood it, at the end, uh, the model that you propose will end up in kind of calculating uh, optimal plan or the best uh, a variety of plans that all try to be as efficient uh, as possible and then propose these plans uh, um, to the public to decide over. But then you will always come into the situation where people will have to enact this plan and this might lead to a situation where those people who will have to enact the plan will perceive this plan as external from themselves, depending on how much they were involved in creating the plan, of course. But uh, still, at least for me, when reading the, the narrative part at the end of the book, there was a certain sense of this like detached planning commission, which seem to be a bunch of experts, quote unquote, that calculates this optimal plan that we are now forced to uh, bring into, into being in, into practice. So there is this element of higher authority coupled to, I would say, the concept of central planning per se. And I would be interested how you uh, conceptualize this in your model. I got the feeling as if your main point would be It's urgent. We need to fucking do something. This is the only way we can do it. That's what. That's the the kind of um, vibe I got, more or less. I have to be honest. I mean, I'll start. Um, Drew, Drew is definitely the more the mathematical whiz of the two of us by far. But I, I think I just want to point out that um, you know what's what's nice about linear programming is that the math as as you saying is not so complex so i think we imagine at some level that everyone would be taking linear programming in school and anyone could make a global plan or anyone can use the modeling tools that one puts out to make a, mod, uh, a plan and one can make their own plans. And like, and this is like the very Noratian approach to socialism where you are showing the working class what the economy is, let them see it through isotypes, make it as visually um, easy to understand and appealing as possible and they'll set up museums and, and you know get hundreds of thousands of people to see see what the Austrian economy looks like and then you can imagine taking it over and I think with this kind of mathematics people will see a relation between their own work and, and what the world what, what, what kind of world they they want and I think uh, this is an important part of what socialist democracy would be and that's not to say that you know people are always going to get the plans that they that they vote for but um, or that they want right but I think it, it, it would be one important way to overcome maybe any kind of reluctance or disagreement I mean again humans are, are always going to disagree I, I I don't think that's going to go away but there's also a reason why it's important for us to have a uh, a more nuanced relationship between local and central planning. And I think uh, a lot of debates on the left are just like, oh, we'll just have like, tiny little communes that are you know, extremely inefficient, uh, and, but they'll be autonomous and that'll be fine. Or we'll have some gigantic tanky solution, uh, like a super plan. And I think uh, what Kantorovic uh, and Beer get into is a much more nimble relationship. Like, it's important to have some things centralized where you can, I guess, not efficient for everyone to make, I don't know, their own uh, high-grade aluminum or something like that. It's better to do in some areas than others. But um, you also want to... We also will have problems with information. That's why you will have a central plan that is relatively vague, and then you get down to finer detail the lower the lower you go. But of course, you know, if a, if a, a planning bureau or the parliament that we imagine that we put in La Paz, you know, votes to have mandatory veganism or something like that, well, I'm sure lots of people, you know, won't like that. No matter how strong the animal rights movement has become 
by, you know, 2040 or whatever it is. I mean, there still would be opposition, but I think that's just what politics is. And socialism would be at some level the politicization of, of everything because it, that is what democratic control over the economy is. I don't think we should be afraid of that. And that's where I think market socialists, you know, escape back to the market. I think they, they, they come close to seeing what socialism looks like, which is what Neurat, you know, you know, tells us in 1919, and then they withdraw because it's it's too terrifying. It's too much conflict. But I, but I think this is a mistake. Yeah, I think um, I think it's uh, the environmental crisis throws a, a wrench into a lot of a lot of things, um, and I think uh, it's just important to remember how um, challenging the questions facing us are. Like. Um, they're more challenging, as we talked about earlier, than the IPCC 1.5 degree report lets on because that report assumes so much BEX, you know, for example. This is an extremely hard problem, making sure that like the dream of the of socialism that, that I have is that everyone on the earth has the resources for a good life, has there's there's a quality, there's everyone has the things they need and we have a planet that's able to sustain this. Um, that's a hard, that's a hard goal. And it's a goal that requires, uh, coordination. Um, and we do try really hard in the book to make sure to emphasize how, if this is not democratic, it will fail, right? There's, there's no way that we imagine this working that, the, the democracy is, is not just like a value. It's just like a, a functioning. Like if you're going to basically get rid of the capitalist engine, which is saying that if you don't work, you'll starve. If you're getting rid of that, then, then you're, you're going to have to have buy-in and democracy is, is how you get buy-in. So it's, um, it has to be democratic. Um, to, to work. I don't know if this is convincing to you. Yeah, no, no, but, but I would say your, your democracy part is also important because, uh, you know, Kantorovich comes up with linear programming, you know, in the 30s, and uh, he talks to God's plan in the 40s, and it doesn't go anywhere because God's plan gets all its power from, and let alone all the, you know, uh, ministries and, and the government get their power from powers of distribution. And if you had people you know voting on a plan and then people carrying out the plan that would take away the, this power from these from these ministries or, or planning bureaus so therefore you needed democracy to actually have linear programming that's why the Soviet Union never did it uh, at scale because it would undo the power of this uh, authoritarian regime well but the way that the plans would come about in in your proposed uh, scheme of things is not through mere linear linear programming as you rightly state in the book this is maybe a tool for certain types of uh, for uh, certain types of questions it might be useful but it is not that people could use linear programming at home to uh, make a plan on their own because the plans that the central planning board bought, quote unquote, uh, would produce would have so much more components included in them from uh, like uh, high level uh, modeling that was uh, repurposed from, from um, climate modeling to like data from I guess, billions and billions of sensors throughout the world and, and so on and so forth. So it is not that people could, through this playful participation, really um, like um, take part in this planning in a meaningful way. So my question would be, how is this interrelationship between central and, and decentral really working out in concrete terms when it comes to a the question of how these plans come about and b how people are rightfully so perceiving it as a democratic act of participation within this process so we finished this book uh, a year ago right maybe even a little more um but uh We've, we've kept thinking about these issues because you're pu you're you're pushing on the right pressure points here. Um, so we've we've been thinking about some uh, uh, other literatures and thinking about some papers, uh, older papers and ideas that uh, revolve around this idea of, of iterative planning or multi-level planning. And the idea here is that um, you would have some rough draft 
from the middle that might might say something like you know some rough estimates then you kind of give that out to stakeholders and in the original um papers this is not it's not overly concerned with democracy but we would we would want it to be democratic so you give it to stakeholders you'd be like okay to this factory do you think this is a reasonable you know like kind of downscaling what the implications of this plan would be do you think this is reasonable do you need more of X or more of Y? Uh, is this just way too much work? Um, you know, is this too much food to expect from this piece of land given, you know, uh, X amount of pesticides are going to be used or not used, that sort of thing. Uh, and then is this, uh, you know, going to cause harm to this uh, environmental region or this these practices here? And then you get the feedback and then you use that to refine and send back up and then maybe you cohere the feedback in some way. So um, try and make coherent uh, these things and produce a new kind of rough idea of the future. You propagate back down, get more feedback. And hopefully after a few cycles of this, of these sets of inputs, you would have um, a set of coherent plans that are plausible at a local level. And then of course, when the plans are enacted, you would have uh, of course, wide leeway on a local level on how to enact them. It would be that the sort of central goals are much more about, are we going to cross planetary boundaries and are we going to make sure that everyone gets the raw amount of energy or food that they need for a good life? Is, is there going to be enough grain production? Is there going to be enough energy production in the right ways? Are our grids stable? Are, um, you know, is the, you know, uh, key ecosystems uh, being managed well by whoever's managing them? You know, are um, that, that sort of rough idea of things. And then, you know, when the plan is enacted, you would have a more local manner. So that, that's how we imagine, we've come to imagine um, from more engagement with these questions, um, how you might produce these plans in a way that has more democratic input. And there've been some experiments with participatory planning out there. Um, they're often very short-lived or, um, or partial. I think there's some, there's a way to make it work uh, that will make, that, that's necessary both for the construction of the plan, you need a, a fair bit of information and input, um, but also in making sure that there's democratic. There was an experiment in Kerala, India in the 1997 to 2002 five-year plan, which was basically an attempt to, you know, have these participatory planning meetings and hundreds of thousands of people got involved. Um, and the idea was to like have this input go into the plan. The problem was, is that there wasn't th this sort of iterative process didn't happen. So you had a lot of great ideas that didn't quite cohered into something cool. So there were some cool things about like pollination, like some people knew about how pollination worked in their fields and they were able to get that incorporated, but it wasn't, it was more like tweaks rather than like a whole, like a dialogue, which is what we would imagine um, being an ideal. So this is a, an inspiring experiment, but um, uh, I mean, obviously you're pointing out this is a challenging problem, right? Like we don't, but, we don't but I, this I, stuff, I, but like, yeah. But Drew, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea is you would have these you know, linear programming models as yeah, a rough draft that people could could examine and vote on and all that. And also the, the linear programming models would relate from like a central, like a, a global plan down to a you know, regional and local plan in various ways. For example, if you vote globally, okay, everyone gets 2000 watts and they have you know, 2,500 calories. And then like the region will say, okay, where are we going to get this energy from? Or, and, and, make, and make another plan to say, okay, it's more efficient getting it from solar versus wind and we'll put things here and there. And then you, as in, you have that kind of relationship of, you know, being specific um, more and more as to go down to the local, but from with parameters set by this, this larger model. But uh, it's not like, you know, you just vote once on a plan and then you have the data simulation, the cybernetics kind of run the plan for infinity. I mean, the way we're imagining is you would have uh, a series of plan, maybe like a five-year plan or whatever timeline you want. And then people can say, I go to parliament and say, okay, what are we going to do in the next five or 10 or 20 years? What are our, 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 our plans for that? And that can be voted on. So I think um, like the linear programming is a guide and the cybernetics is, you know, how you implement these things. But I, I don't think it's, it's once you've allowed cybernetics and suddenly becomes undemocratic. I mean, it's, it's just a, a tool. Well, I'm I'm so sorry, but I have to disagree. Please, <laughs> it's please. not just a tool. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry because I mean, there there are, I think at least two points uh, within the book where where this um, idea of 
just being a tool comes up you know, with regard to um, linear programming. And now, um, uh, Troy, you just mentioned it in, in, with regard to, to cybernetics, but it is not just a tool. I, um, I mean, let's take the case of, of cybernetics. It, it is founded on a, a functional equalization of humans and machines as information processing systems. And by looking at the situation, From, from such a perspective, one will find very different solutions to problems compared to someone who looks at the problem uh, informed by, by a different paradigm, so to speak. So, so these are not neutral uh, tools or neutral theories, but they incorporate a certain perspective on things um, that, that carries along um, certain assumptions about the, the things that are addressed within the models, so to speak. And I mean, at least as, as I understood it in the case of um, uh, linear programming, the way that you build up uh, your idea of synthesis, synthesizing uh, different approaches towards planning, as far as I read it, it more or less said, all right, we have this idea of linear programming, we have this as a um, as a mode of approaching certain problems where it might be adequate, But you cannot adapt to like uh, con constant changes uh, very well. And because of that, trying to approach planning merely through the perspective of linear programming is insufficient. And I would totally agree. And because of that, you go on to take a look at different other approaches, one of them being cybernetics. But that does also mean that Uh, what you just tried to describe, Troy, that we would all be kind of able to to understand or maybe even reproduce this process would not be possible because, as I said before, uh, linear program is just one piece within a very complex system of uh, producing different plans that then uh, that that will then be de decided upon. Um, I'm not sure where, where this is leading me because it's not really uh, a question and I stated uh, this, uh, this before. It's just that I think for me, it's, uh, it, it was a bit, um, a bit difficult to get to grips with this, um, this directionality and this, this like, um, emphasis on a center that has at the end the, the, the knowledge that is needed in order to, to compute these plans. And because there are so many problems that go along with this, because it is also not innocent to have like five or 10 or 50 or 100 plans, because by choosing, by pre-selecting the different plans, you already enact like such a huge power because you kind of uh, present the field upon which the further game will be played. And this is such an Im immense power. And it is not that these are like merely like neutral technocrats that are just kind of doing this for, for the sake of humanity or anything. Even, even if they do, it will be, would be problematic on epistemic grounds and on, on, on grounds of, uh, of question of power and stuff like that. So I think I was kind of, um, like uh, arguing with myself with this type of constellation between the 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 individuals and and the the center and then of course the question comes up how do you get people to do this like if you have this plan how if if how how do you get them to to enact it so if there are no monetary incentives which i absolutely loved about the uh, the model you do not want to force people into doing anything and you want to give them like very a uh, very high level of existential security which i absolutely loved about the model and you that's this is absolutely right the way you approach it but there are so many questions that that come up after <laughs> came up to for me after after reading this constellation which for me at least kind of tended a bit too much in this in the in the direction of central planning because i'm i'm absolutely convinced as you are that it that both is needed we do need central elements we do need decentral elements but uh, from from my kind of understanding There, there were so many open questions after reading the, the, the proposal and most of it came out of a, 
uh, the the high level of centrality and be uh, like implicit assumptions about knowledge and where the the knowledge can actually be brought together at the end and this yeah this this was just uh, something i i ended up with uh, at the end this is not really a question <laughs> Well, thank you for expressing this. This is a uh, a sort of uh, an early stab, a first a first uh, attempt here, and we don't claim that our our modeling here. It's certainly not been the pause of our thought. We continue to think about these issues. We've we've continued to to um you know read new stuff, think new stuff, uh, think about new models. So, you know, uh, I would really love to read more of uh, other people's thinking about how we might build a non-monetary economy, uh, a pl a, an economy that does manage to navigate the very difficult challenge of the environmental crisis uh, and the amount of coordination that we're involves without, um, you know, uh, the undesirable consequence of over-centralization or of, or of our current system, which is complete and blindly walking into disaster uh, that, and everyone is blind to the full picture or not everyone, but like that we're all making small decisions based on small incentives and it's creating an, a, a force that just leading us to ruin. Um, so obviously we need a middle ground, right? Um, how does that middle ground get constructed? And what we've tried to do, um, so I guess I'll respond to a couple of the comments. So about technology never being neutral, this is a, of course true. And about tech technocracy never being neutral is, of course, true. What we tried to do is try and, but we also think that there needs to be some, uh, I guess, administrative division of labor. We don't want everyone coming into meetings every day to plan things, I guess. So there's some amount of administrative division of labor. So we imagine still a parliament sort of system. Um, so we have this sort of, uh, elected official sort of thing going on, um, which is already a compromise. We all know how representative democracy has its failings. Um, and so there, there's all these compromises we're trying to make along the way to try and balance all these different tendencies. And that, that technology is never neutral is, is an important one, but that technology is uh, that, that, that the tools that we have developed to think about the world system, the, the earth system scientifically, seem to have promise uh, in, in balancing uh, environmental constraints um, is also there. And the question is, can we use this technology in a way that uh, is democratic and is able to, to be just? Um, I guess we're optimistic. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I'm sort of trailing off here, Troy. What do you want yeah, to say? Yeah, true. I think you can see too much. I mean, yeah, and I would push you to formulate your questions or your criticism more clearly. I mean, are you saying, like, okay, no, there's no one mind with all the knowledge in the world? I mean, it's kind of Hayekian argument. And you're like, okay, sure. <laughs> I, I agree. But I mean, uh, and this is why, again, we're talking about having these layered plans um like the central planning the global planning bureau will set fairly loose guidelines according to these uh planetary boundaries and or just boundaries for a good life like how many calories or energy does a person need and then how to actually carry that out will be left up to regional and local government um and so i think there's 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 that Aspects, so I, I would agree with that, but we don't we don't make this claim of having having total knowledge. And then, of course, you know, we, yeah, technology isn't neutral. I mean, uh, sure, but I also would say that you know, cybernetics being some kind of like wicked uh, military uh, form of thinking is also a too simple uh, critique. Not that I'm saying you're saying that, but some people, are, of course, uh, are very skeptical of cybernetics for this reason. I mean, Beer was a huge hippie. Uh, you know, Wiener himself was incredibly um antagonistic to to uh, the military after the war as well i mean i think it's 
um, and we're not proposing yeah, merely, okay, we'll just see a bunch of experts to figure things out. That's not, that's not what we're saying. And again, we're trying to make this much more Neuratian point of you have to get as many people involved and as many people to understand what, what the economy is. And, you know, will that be perfect or, you know, will, will everyone have, you know, complete knowledge? No, but I think uh, one should try. And then how exactly does one organized socialist democracy like do we have referendums like do we have a parliament i mean these are things we should be thinking about but i think the alternative to say oh these things are too difficult and therefore we have to do a market socialism and then rely on on, on a market mechanism will not suffice to solve the problems we need to solve which again you know mainly in the environmental problems if you know we need to have us agree as a species okay we want to have only this much carbon emitted we want to have only this much land deforested if we want to stop climate change or the sixth extinction if only part of us agree then it doesn't really matter what the rest of us do so i mean uh, i again uh, maybe if you could reformulate what, what your critiques are i'd be interested to hear it Yes, absolutely. But first of all, I, I neither said that uh, that I think that cybernetics is just some uh, some form of military uh, wish wash or anything as such. I just pointed out that it is not in that all these theories are not neutral in any way, but that they do imply some some pre assumptions that make a difference. I'm I'm absolutely uh, pro uh, including cybernetics 100 into our thinking. So I'm not actually stating that. Neither am I in any way shape or form uh, a market socialist. So <laughs> if you pose it uh, like either we do it your way or uh, people are market socialists, and this is also an adequate, uh, inadequate uh, description of the situation between all the three of us right now, because I'm not in favor of market socialism. So just to make that clear. And then maybe I can make it a bit more clear when it comes to the question of detail, because right now you stated that Uh, the uh, central planning board would only kind of um, give out some like broad uh, guidelines or something like that. And this would be something very different. And uh, when I read the narrative part at the end of the book, and this is uh, the, the part that maybe created this, this uh, sense of over centrality um, the most, I guess, there were some points within this narrative where people were like all right ah, okay now um, the because of the central board deciding that uh, this labor should be allocated over there and and people should uh, do X Y that over there we will now have to um, kind of try to enact it you know and so there was a very clear sense of this uh, directionality coming from Uh, the center in terms of the center has computed some kind of ideal plan and I'm uh, uh, being po polemic here a bit just to make the argument there was this sense of there is this central board uh, computing the central uh, this ideal plan and now we will have to find ways to enact it and this kind of directionality is important I think because it will decide over the question whether or not people do experience um, democratic plant economies as democratic plant economies in terms of democratic uh, in uh, like uh, all caps, you know, um, because uh, um, this, as you rightly st uh, stated out, be, uh, stated before, Drew, this is like essential to actually making this work because if they do not and you do not have any types of in like monetary incentives or other forms of coercions then this whole thing will not work out to me it seems as if the the way it is set up right now this form of over centralization leads to a point where where the 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 plan maybe by being too detailed is first like assuming uh, uh, epistemic aspects that I guess I would not share in terms of can this knowledge actually come together at this point. And Troy, you were um, rightly so, I think, pointing towards tacit knowledge and the question of how to handle this one. So this is the first one. And then uh, if it is too detailed and not only in the, in the, in the framework of like loose, not loose, but broad guidelines, you will come to a point where it will be experienced as external by the people who will have to enact it. 
Those are the two things. And, and this makes a very big difference because if you, for example, look at um, models where questions of, um, of economic planning are handled through like prices for central categories of production, then you will have a very broad uh, set of uh, indicative prices that, that, that then kind of uh, indirectly lead to a form of uh, a coordination uh, within, the, within the system in a very loose way. But I, I had the sense that within the uh, proposal that you are bringing forward, the, this type of um, detail in terms of what is planned and what is not planned and who is uh, involved in which aspects of planning is, is a very different one. So I hope this is a, a little bit more <laughs> clear. Yeah, no, this is this is nice. And this is actually, this is a, a really good place to be talking about the appropriate level of detail. Um, and I, I definitely think, um, I definitely think that this is, this is, this is, I think the right area to be focusing on what is the appropriate level of detail at each level of the plan, right? We're, we're imagining some sort of kind of federative, right? Like structure, right? Where that. And then the, the concreteness goes down. And I think what we were trying to get at with the narrative, and I think it was insufficiently clear, is that the, the planning in sort of the Central Valley of Massachusetts would be done, like, as in terms of, like, you know, how many, you know, like, we have these factories and these farms here, here, and here, and, you know, how much labor is required for each. And then if someone puts in an application for, for work, and, you know, and they want to live here, like, these are the options, right, to choose from. That, that level of detail would be at that kind of, county to city level, I guess. And so this would not be set up by, you know, the US or the Eastern US or the North America or the global level, right? It would be more like we need, we think we, we think we want some, some vegetables, right? Uh, and then we can grow some out here, um, right? But that was, that was sort of what we were going for. So we, we don't imagine that that we imagine that that detail is, is, is more local. From there, we can have a conversation about whether that's too much or too little detail. And I think that would be a really, that's, that's the sort of, I think, really nice detailed conversation that I would love to have, um, you know, in this sort of discussions of how we might do planning. And the question of, you know, whether do you do, you do quantities, do you do indicative prices, do you do, you know, what is your, what is your mechanism for doing this? Um, we've been talking about, um, sort of in Natura units. So like we, we, I guess, have been leaning more on the, the sort of a quota slash quantity side of planning, but perhaps there could be a case that in for planning certain aspects of things, you know, an indicative price and then allowing things to do this in some controlled way might be a reasonable way of doing local planning or something like this. I, I think I think we kind of intentionally leave it a little vague um, about how these plans are carried out. So I, I, I think... Um, I don't actually think we disagree very much, which is of course a classic thing for me to say, but I think, I don't actually think we, I think, I think this is the sort of detail that we kind of didn't flesh out too much in the book, maybe to our own detriment. Well, the book is quite short, just for listeners to know. Um, we cover a lot of ground at a very high level, which might get us in trouble. Uh, but um, I think, uh, I think that this is this is a good conversation. I, I would be nice to build up a more detailed model to like answer all these questions and try and think about like what the right level of detail is, what planning tools might be used at different levels, what is the appropriate level of detail at different levels in terms of both information gathering and in terms of both experiencing it at, as a non-coercive system. Um, I don't know if that was coherent, but those are my thoughts to what you just said. <laughs> Yes, and I mean, I, I just uh, want to point out that there were were a, a couple of things that I really liked about reading <laughs> all of this. So that it's not that I was reading and I was uh, uh, constantly thinking, oh my God, uh, this is uh, too authoritarian uh, central planning. Uh, there were quite some elements that I really enjoyed. Uh, for example, the this uh, whole engagement with the question of modeling and how this could be a nested way of modeling in order order to kind of avoid this uh, this idea of just having one uh, uh, central uh, point where the data comes together because as uh, you state in the book uh, in the case of uh, climate modeling and weather modeling this could never be accurate because you will have to have a form of nested uh, uh, approach in order to to get to a point where you will be able to more or less uh, get a 
picture or an, an idea of a very, very dynamic uh, uh, system that you are trying to uh, get an idea of. So I, I thought this was really interesting. And um, I uh, immediately, immediately thought, okay, well, this would be interesting to get into, <laughs> into contact with some people who are actually doing this and, uh, and how this could be then reappropriated to kind of use this uh, uh, Noretian uh, in natura approach that you uh, uh, obviously um, uh, like very much. And I, uh, since this was a really big question mark for me, how would this in natura uh, calculation actually look like? I had, I didn't really uh, immediately had an inner image or idea how this would be approached in concrete terms because of course there are so many things uh, and that a, um, a modern economy is made up of that comparing everything in natura of course kind of uh, uh, brings you in a difficult spot as well and since I was very much interested in how to approach actual in natura ca calculation in modern economies and on the other hand you were pointing towards these types of modern model uh, modeling i was very much intrigued in how how this would go about or how do you uh, think about this pair which i was perceiving as a as an interesting fit actually i suppose like the next step you know for this kind of project would be to think more seriously about making like a, a world model Right. And then or, or work with people on uh, regional or local models. It's just to assume the global model says this, then how would it say, you know, Austria figure it out and what would Vienna look like based on those constraints and kind of work it out. And I think this is, again, the Neuratian part where uh, socialism is imagining these features and having discussions about how we should should live. but. Um, You're, you're right where I think the in natura um, parts of the plan would have to be a different radiance of detail. And I think, uh, and I, you know, I can imagine, you know, you, you would just say, you know, like how large is the chemical industry or how many, you know, uh, you know fertilizer or uh, pesticides do you want? And then part, as in you could have some kind of way to group that, but then there would also be a way to zero in and say, okay, what does that look like in terms of, you know, phosphorus versus ammonia and, and so forth, right? And I think you want to have enough, I like guess, less detail to look at these things in total, which again, we try to get into the book, like, because we want people to really engage with these questions of energy and land use uh, and the kind of nature we want um, and then one can zero in if they want great so at the end of uh, every interview i ask my guests if you think about the future what makes you joyful i think writing this book has been a joyful experience because at some level, I think it's possible for us to overcome the environmental crisis and to overcome capitalism and to ensure the good life for all without sliding into some horrible dictatorship. I think it, it's not beyond humanity at, at, some, at some level. And um, we just want to convince more people <laughs> that this is the case because otherwise there's too much doom and gloom. Yeah, I think in writing this book, we've been Uh, we've encountered people who are thinking very hard about issues like the practical details of transcending capitalism rather than simply critiquing, critiquing, critiquing. It's easy to critique, but as soon as you offer something, then people can come after you, which is good because it helps us refine our ideas. But uh, <laughs> it's um, it, being introduced to, to all these people thinking about these issues has been really, really wonderful. And um, it makes me very excited that we can hammer out the details in an appropriate way that we, we are able to, to walk these mini tight ropes uh, that we'll need to walk to, to build the future we all want. Great. And I hope you didn't get the sense that I was coming after you because I, I wasn't. I really uh, en enjoyed that you were putting out this concrete ideas on how things could be approached because I absolutely agree that we do need more of this type of uh, engagement with uh, how things could actually be done differently. So... Uh, No, no. I mean, Thank this you. this think tank. I mean, think tank. This podcast, sorry, is is amazing because there aren't that many that really get into the nitty gritty of 
of planning theory. And it's been a real joy to listen to your podcast and uh, and to be have a place where we can really get into the weeds of some of the more uh, obscure stuff in the book, because not, not everyone wants to talk about Soviet mathematics. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks, thanks so much for having us. Thank you, too. Yeah, this is really great. Yeah. Uh, it'd be wonderful to talk even more and, and think more, and maybe maybe our we have this iterative democracy um, thing for a um, Philip Dabrick's conference in late June, early July. So maybe we could get more feedback there. So I mean, we're we're still working and thinking. So I mean, hopefully we can continue to to talk and develop ideas. Perfect. Okay, Troy and Drew, thank you so much for being part of Future Histories. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.